everyone, this is Tyler Dallas from the FW de Clark Foundation, and you're listening to the Constitution at Work podcast, the series for people interested in constitutional matters and transformation in South Africa. Today, we are joined by advocate Mark Oppenheimer, a practicing member of the Johannesburg Bar and expert on hate speech in South Africa, to continue our discussion on the hate speech bill. As always, I'm also joined by Dave Stewart, chairperson of the FW de Clark Foundation. Thank you to each of you for joining us, and with that, let's jump straight in. Mark, you have appeared in the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court in a number of cases that seek to determine the boundary between freedom of expression and genuine hate speech. Notably, these have included the Masuku case, where the court held that anti-Zionist words amounted to hate speech, and the Kulani case, where the court importantly held that the hate speech clause under the Equality Act was an unconstitutional infringement on the rights of freedom of expression, confirming that merely hurtful speech does not qualify as prohibited hate speech. Given your experience over the last decade in our courts on this matter and the seeming lack of clarity for when something harmful should face sanction, what does constitute hate speech for purposes of liability and what elements would need to be proven for the bill's envisaged crime of hate speech? Yes, as you point out, there's been much confusion over the years. I think the term hate speech is often used quite colloquially to refer to that speech which I hate. Um, and so the, the kinds of cases that pop out in people's minds, I think, would no longer meet the new hate speech threshold test as set by the Constitutional Court in Kualani. So, for example, uh, Penny Sparrow's case, I think most people can recognize that referring to black people as monkeys uh, is racist. Um, the court in uh, that instance found that the words were hurtful and that was sufficient to find hate speech. Um, that was criticized by the court in Kamalo, another case that I appeared in, and the court said it, it cannot be that merely hurtful speech amounts to hate speech, and that's been confirmed by the Constitutional Court. So a lot of those cases that um, are writ large in people's minds as being um, exemplar, examples of hate speech aren't really hate speech. In order to meet that threshold, what we now need to do is say there must be the advocacy of hatred um, on a listed ground, and the Constitution mentions four grounds. So that's race, gender, ethnicity, and religion. Um, and the uh, Equality Act includes a number of other grounds as well. So sexual orientation, for example, is listed, um, language, uh, culture, national background. So those are gonna be included. And that it must then either incite harm or that the words themselves are harmful. So this deviates from the constitutional test. The constitution doesn't talk about directly harmful speech. It only refers to uh, incitement to harm. And incitement to harm, really what you're doing is calling on people to perform a harm against one of those targeted groups. So there's already some deviation um, in the equality uh, legislation from what we have in the constitution. And the only way that you're entitled to deviate is if you use what's called the section 36 limitations analysis, that it must be reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic country to further intrude into the free speech rights. And so the Constitutional Court has given that. But it's done it in a civil setting. So in the Equality Court framework, uh, you can't be sent to prison. Um, you can be fined, you can be made to apologize, you can be interdicted, you can lose a license, um, but you cannot go to jail. Uh, the court has the power to refer what you did to the NPA to see if you have committed a different kind of crime. So for example, you might have breached the Rights of Assemblies Act. Uh, that legislation talks about a prohibition on calling on people to commit crimes. So, for example, if in your speech you said, you know, um, this group of people should be murdered, um, that might very well be hate speech and a breach of the Rights Assemblies Act. But the Equality Court itself can't hold you criminally liable. What we do have is the um, Hate Crimes and Hate Speech Bill that has been floating around since about 2016. Um, it's a bill that has changed form quite dramatically. Uh, it was introduced just after the Penny Sparrow incident and to my mind was largely used as a kind of power grab by the state to say, well, there seems to be a lot of sympathy um, for regulating speech. Let's see how much um, freedom we can take from people. And so you had um, um, a huge range of speech that could be limited. So for example, if you made fun of someone on the grounds of their occupation, uh, that constituted hate speech. So if you made fun of someone like Jacob Zuma, um, you could wind up in jail. And so that's, um, you know, Clearly, it's totalitarian legislation. There was a big pushback from civil society, um, and the bill uh, has morphed since then. Uh, the latest version uh, has still got some problems in it. Uh, it it's tries to mirror, in some ways, the Kualani test, but it does have criminal sanctions. 
And so there's reason to think that it should hew much closer to the constitution instead of the civil standard because the consequence is going to jail for a period of eight years. And that's a much greater infringement on someone's uh, freedom and dignity than merely making them apologize or pay a fine. So the Quilani ruling emphasized that the expression, as you said, of unpopular or even offensive beliefs does not constitute hate speech. Many have held that the bill does not protect ordinary South Africans' rights to publicly express unpopular opinions, thoughts, and even offensive beliefs due to the wide definition of hate speech, harm, victim, and then the narrow grounds for exemptions. Dave, do you usher these concerns? Well, yes, indeed. And the question that I, I have is, why do we need new legislation on this? Uh, we have the the Bapuda Act at the moment, which provides uh, sanction against uh, against uh, this kind of speech. We have Section 16 in the Constitution. We have the common law recourse to criminal injuria. What is the motive behind this? That's, that is the question I have. And uh, I think the ANC let the cat out of the bag in 2017 when the National Executive Committee made a statement in which they said, well, we need to fast track this hate speech bill so that we can crack down on people like Helen Ziller, who made these unacceptable comments on colonialism. So uh, if, if, if that is an indication of what uh, the ANC actually has in mind with this legislation, then we must all be very, very careful indeed. This would strike a blow to the, one of the basic requirements for a constitutional democracy, and that is the ability to receive and to express your views. Section 16 states, everyone has the right to freedom of expression, which includes the right to freedom to receive and impart information or ideas. Now, the parliamentary committee provided members with research to substantiate the drafting, the current drafting of the bill, in which they held that there was no reliable data on the number of hate crimes being committed in South Africa. With regard to hate speech, they relied on data from the South African Human Rights Commission for 2020 to 2021, which showed equality complaints were distributed as follows. 60% dealt with race. Any other ground constituted 14%. Disability accounted for 8%. Sexual orientation, 6%. Religion, ethnic or social origin, 4%. And then age, color, gender, language and birth, respectively 1%. However, this data does not equate to the number of complaints which were upheld and face sanction. Mark, given what Dave has just said, what do you think the intention of the bill is, given that this data is not upholding that it's necessary to combat racial tension? Yes, I think it's worth knowing what the actual number of complaints are, as opposed to just mere percentages. If you look at the number of equality court cases where there are judgments, it's absolutely tiny. So to give you an indication, whenever I appear in the high court, you have a case number attached to your case, and it's normally matter number 19,324. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was in matters one, two, and three in the equality court. Um, they are very, very rare. Equality court cases just get a lot of high profile attention. So everybody was aware of the Penny Sparrow case and you get the sense that there's this epidemic of racism, but that's not what we really find. Um, I had an interesting um, conversation with the former legal head at the Human Rights Commission, Bong Jones. Um, we did a panel discussion for News 24 and he conceded at the end, he said, you know, racism is a very rare thing and most Africans get on with each other. Um, but he was very keen on uh, on having criminal sanctions. And he said, specifically so that we can um, lock up Mark's clients. Um, and this wasn't said as a joke. In other words, the NGOs that I act for are seen as being too critical of the government. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could silence them with either the threat um, of them lingering in a prison cell or actually ensuring that they're behind bars? Uh, I do think that it's politically motivated. One of the worries um, that one would have with legislation like this is that it won't be meted out equally, that um, there has been a concern that uh, the powerful um, and the connected are much less likely to, to be sanctioned um, than ordinary citizens. So if you look at what the Constitutional Court says in Kualani, it says that part of the test for determining whether it's hate speech is how powerful the speaker is, you know, looking at the context. 
And really, the people that we should be most concerned about are those that wield enormous political power that, you know, can say these things at mass rallies, as opposed to little old lady estate agents in the middle of nowhere. And our case law seems to, you know, go after the nobodies as opposed to the powerful. The powerful often um, seem to escape um, escape liability, and that's a concern. And there is a worry that it'll be used against, um, you know, opposition political parties to silence them. What's interesting about um, Zilla's colonialism tweet is that um, she was uh, sanctioned by the public protector, uh, Makwabane, uh, and she uh, took this on appeal and was successful in the Supreme Court of Appeal after Kulani came out. And there was a finding that the words didn't constitute hate speech. Um, but we should be very wary of, of silencing speech. Um, there, are, there are cases when speech is a problem, um, specifically to my mind, when you are calling on vulnerable minorities um, to be killed. Uh, that seems like the speech that we ought to push back against, especially when you have um, a wider context where actual violence is being perpetrated against those groups. Um, but generally, my view is that what you want to try and do with speech that you find offensive or repugnant is to counter dialogue it, um, to point out why it's wrong in the public square. Um, also, there's some use in knowing that these hateful views are around so you can amp up the temperature. One of the examples that I often give to people is to say, in South Africa, we don't ban depictions of the swastika. Um, and we almost never see it being flown. And that's very useful for the Jewish community to know. In other words, if it does pop up, you can say, okay, there's clearly some appetite for anti-Semitism. We should do something about it. For example, in the Masuku case, uh, protesters waved a swastika. Um, but it's a very, very rare instance. And so then you could counter dialogue that. You could put more resources into um, Holocaust education. If you've banned it, then you have no idea how much sympathy people have for those hateful ideas. Um, you lose the information. You know, I'd much rather have the bigots show me who they are for free, and uh, then you can keep an eye on them in other ways. Exactly, Mark, and that's what the foundation also asserts, that the censorship of free expression will do nothing to eliminate hate, but it will drive it further underground and make it harder to identify reports and act against. Let's now turn to the comments made by EFF leader Julius Malema at the party's Provincial People's Assembly in Western Cape last month. Now, Malema is no stranger to pushing the realm of free speech. In this speech, for our viewers, Malema instructed his supporters to track down and attend to the identifiable white man who was part of the violent clashes that erupted between EFF members and parents outside Brackenfell High School in 2020, before going on to state that the supporters should never be scared to kill as a revolution demand that at some point they must be killing because the killing is part of a revolutionary act. In addition to these comments, posters displayed at the event by EFF members read honeymoon is over for white people in South Africa and a, a revolutionary must become a cold killing machine motivated by pure hate. The South African Human Rights Commission held Malema's speech and these posters, prima facie, individually and collectively, constitute incitement of violence, hate speech and possible other transgressions of the Equality Act. The EFF had 10 days to appropriately retract and apologize for the statements in question and give appropriate undertakings to desist from further promotion of hatred and violence on any ground, which it failed to do. The South African Human Rights Commission will now supposedly approach the Equality Court for relief. But why were these, st these statements treated differently to similar previous rants of Malema? Mark? Yes, you're right. I mean, the Human Rights Commission has a long history of giving the EFF and Mr. Malema a complete free ride. So there are instances where um, they have found that the words uttered by the EFF don't constitute hate speech. Um, when on you know an ordinary understanding of the terms, we would think that they do. Um, there is also a sense in which Malema has escaped liability time and time again. I think it's been emboldened by this. Uh, I. I think the, the Human Rights Commission said that even a child could tell that uh, these words constitute hate speech. They're, to my mind, also evidence of a crime. You're calling for targeted killing of an identifiable person. That's a breach of the Rights Assemblies Act. Uh, there are huge racial undertones to this idea of killing in a revolution. As you say, you've got posters up saying the honeymoon for whites is over. Um, Malema during that speech makes references to, to white racists and whites generally, um, and the idea that you shouldn't be afraid of killing. It should be the kind of thing that we find absolutely chilling. There was almost no reporting of the incident at all. It was said at a mass gathering um, of, of supporters in the Western Cape. Um, I do worry that uh, the press and others have given the FFO free ride for too long. Um, 
it is interesting that you say that the Human Rights Commission said, please apologize first um, before, um, you know, swiftly taking action, which they've done with other people. So with Adam Katsavellos, for example, um, there was no, you know, please apologize. It was, you know, we're out for blood. Um, and the EFF's response um, was basically to spit in their face and say, how dare you white supremacists ask us to apologize? Um, and they don't really deny the meaning of the words. And they sort of make a claim that, you know, there's a, a metaphor at play, but they don't really say the words don't mean what they evidently mean. They say it's justified. They say we're in a revolution, so we have to start the killing. What's the problem? Why are you upset about this? And then, of course, you know, cite um, uh, all sorts of theoretical terms, like lots of critical race theory in there, lots of reference to Fanon, um, you know, implying that the Human Rights Commission aren't uh, boned up on the correct academic lingo. Um, and that should also be a worry. Um, you know, those are the kinds of texts that are taught at schools or, um, or at universities, and they clearly give cover to people that are filled with um, nothing but pure hatred to fuel their killing machines. Dave, how do you respond to the comments by Malema? Well, of course, they are very, very disturbing. When you get the leader of the third largest political party in the country calling on his followers to kill people, but clearly also on a racial basis, then you have a very dangerous situation. And one wonders why this wasn't covered more prominently in the mainstream media or by foreign correspondents in South Africa. And it, I think it points to a, a, a great failing in the approach of the government and of the Human Rights Commission to this whole question of hate speech. The Human Rights Commission is supposed to be the agent of the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. One would think, therefore, that they would follow the guidelines, the hate speech guidelines that have been laid down by the International Convention. And the International Convention is particularly concerned about uh, expressions emanating from public officials like Julius Malema. They say, to quote, especially statements attributed to high-ranking officials. Now, Z Malema would certainly qualify for that. The other thing that, that really worries us is the question of objectivity. Will all South Africans be judged on an equal basis uh, when it comes to allegations of hate speech? And there, we've got to be very worried because the Human Rights Commission itself has said that uh, that there, there must be different standards when it comes to judging uh, uh, hate speech committed by white South Africans and black South Africans. It is said that uh, uh, the commission is purposefully lenient, lenient to black offenders in incidents concerning racial utterances made to white victims because of the historical context. And, and later, they actually uh, they they go on to say that it's it's not the it's not the targeted group that should uh, feel offended. It that 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 you know constitutes a hate crime. It is what the majority thinks in their judgment on uh, on Malema's statement of the sixth of November, uh, twenty sixteen, where he called on. But said to his supporters, we're not calling for the slaughtering of all white people, at least not for now. They said that, that for a thing to be hurtful, hurtful should be interpreted as meaning severe psychological impact, which the statement viewed in its context would not have for most South Africans. To the extent that the statement might have severe, a severe impact on a proportion of South Africans, for example, farmers who feel unsafe, it would still fail the objective test for hate speech. So what they're more or less saying is, if, if the speech doesn't offend the majority, then it's not hate speech. If it only offends a targeted minority, then that's too bad. <laughs> Alarming indeed, Dave, and you've consistently also made the point that Malema's comments are not those of an aberrant individual expressing unacceptable views on social media, but are presumably the considered views and policy of his party. Also, just for our listeners, the objective test that Dave refers to is under Section 41A of the bill, where it reads that 
anything to one or more persons in a manner that could reasonably be construed. Reasonably meaning the reasonable person objective test. Just mark back to you, would the bill not be the answer to this type of comment then? Surely this type of racial call, call for racial violence should face criminal sanction as envisaged under the bill. Yes, so uh, I differ from Dave in this front in that I think that we don't have mere duplication. In other words, we don't have criminal sanctions for genuine hate speech, and there might very well be constitutional room for having criminal sanctions for hate speech. Um, what the Constitution itself does is just give a carve out. So what it does is to say there are certain kinds of speech that um, the executive has the, the power or the legislature has the power um, to regulate. That's what Section 16 does. It doesn't, 16.2 doesn't prohibit any speech. It just says that if you want to legislate here, you can. And what we've chosen to do is just have these um, civil sanctions. I think that there is some kind of speech like this kind of speech where there is a worry that it will lead to mass violence um, and that there's good reason to curtail that with criminal sanctions. Um, but as I've said, it, said in the beginning, uh, you want to ensure that you don't infringe on freedom any more than you than you have to and you don't want to go beyond a constitutional standard and to my mind the bill in its current form does do that um it's got an ambiguous question around uh, intent um ordinarily um you know the standard in criminal law is whether you've done something intentionally and wrongfully this straddles a line it's not about um the the intent of the speaker it's about as you say um how that intent could be understood by a third party um and and I, I have some sympathy for this view because what you'll often find is that the speaker will say, um, well, as much as it looks like I'm calling for the mass slaughter of people on the grounds of their race, I only mean it metaphorically, you know, um, and they'll give you some sort of bogus interpretation. So, you know, you do require, you know, an objective judge to kind of look at it and say, well, hold on, what do the words really mean, you know, regardless of what you, uh, you're telling us now under duress uh, that they mean. So, yeah, but it's... The bill in its current form does strike me as, as going too far. One of the difficulties, of course, is in how harm is defined. Um, so the, the ones that concern me specifically there are there's the inclusion of cultural harm and social harm. Uh, cultural harm has been used in Malaysia to jail people. Um, people there was a woman who had an OnlyFans account, um, and this was viewed as culturally harmful to the, the values of, of Malaysians, and so she was jailed. And so you sort of wonder whose culture, you know, um, a very nebulous concept was going to count as a cultural harm. Um, and so we should be wary about things like that. Traditionally, I think when we talk about harm, we're thinking about physical harm. In other words, you could be um, destroying property, you could be in, you know, infringing on someone's bodily integrity. Um, maybe there's an argument for economic harm, um, although you know, I think you want boycotts. People have the freedom to kind of call for the boycotting of certain kinds of shops or businesses. It's quite a current common thing to do in protest. And to criminalize that speech could also have very negative consequences. Another concern in the bill is the broad definition of characteristics and grounds. In a recent committee meeting, advocate Dennis Breitenbach held that the bill sets out an impossible task to try prosecute under and would make the jobs of the NPA and police much harder by requiring all elements be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. This would include that the crime was based on a specific characteristic or ground beyond a reasonable doubt. What are your thoughts on this, Mark? Yes, so there's going to be some cases, um, let's say, in a, in a, let's look at the hate crime sort of situation. Let's say you have an um, Indian person who attacks a black person, okay, and you're trying to work out whether it's a hate crime or not. You could say, well, the races of the perpetrator and the victim are different. Um, whether that gives you an indication of whether it's a hate crime or not, you know, you want something more. You want to know that the attack was based on it. And it does strike me as the kind of thing where if you're going to have additional sanctions for it, that you must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the motivation for the crime was racial hatred. Um, it does make it more difficult for the NPA, but we might think that that's a good thing. Um, interestingly enough, in the States, um, uh, they were teaching a course on you know how you should deal with these kinds of hate crimes. And they said, well, one, one way to uh, determine it would be to check if there were any racial epithets that were used. Um, so, you know, were you calling people derogatory, you know, uh, racist names? So for example, um, you could call someone a kike uh, if they're Jewish, uh, sort of seen as a common anti-Semitic slur. And the students um, who were in the seminar got very, very upset about the use of these um, slurs in front of them. They said, no, no, you can't utter those words. 
So it's now made it very difficult to teach people about the kinds of things that you would use to determine whether there was a hate crime because of people's sensitivity to offensive language. Um, so, but yeah, but to my mind, you want evidence that the the act, the speech act, or the crime was committed based on one of those grounds, not that the person just happened to have one of those grounds. But then it seems, Mark, that we're almost requiring the state to protect us from all these different broadly defined types of harm that we may experience. Dave, is that the role of the state? Should the state be protecting us like a parent from these various forms of harm we may experience? Well, once again, you know, it comes down to the intent of the Constitution. We are supposed to have a multi-party system of democratic government. And we cannot have that system, a system that is supposed to be open, responsive, and accountable, if people cannot participate in robust political de debate. Uh, I think the Kalani judgment has made it clear that something that hurts your feelings is not hate speech. The problem is with the, the, with the hate speech bill, that it, it makes that line between acceptable uh, language and unacceptable language, extremely fuzzy and open to interpretation. And as we've seen in previous cases, the interpretation might quite often in our kind of society be biased. So at the end of the day, we have enough legislation already to punish egregious statements. We have uh, the Caputo Act, we have criminal injuria. It's not necessary to have further legislation of this kind. The idea that you can be jailed for up to three years for a first offense for making a point that may be hurtful to somebody will dampen completely the, the flow of communication in our democracy. It will mean that, that editors and People producing TV programs will have to be extremely careful about what they say. It will have a huge impact on what people can say on social media. And all of that will be very detrimental to our idea of a constitutional democracy. In an article in the SA Jewish Report from 2018, Mark, you warned that before enacting this legislation, the state should remember Judge Barker's warning that to deny free speech to engineer social change in the hope of accomplishing a greater good for one section of our society erodes the freedoms of all. Can you unpack this reference further? Why would denying free speech erode freedom for all? Yes, well, Dave goes into it. And once you have the threat of being imprisoned, um, it's not just the speech that would fall foul of legislation that will disappear. It's other speech, too, because people won't want to take a risk, uh, especially when you have fuzzy language. And no one will know um, whether they could fall foul of it. So, you know, if you live in a totalitarian dictatorship where it's very clear that some groups get protected over others, you know, then some groups will speak with impunity, knowing that there'll be no consequences for them. Um, I think in South Africa, we're not quite there yet. I think there is a sense that some groups um, are treated with special favors over others, but that those sands shift. Um, so which should make people quite uncomfortable in terms of what they feel, feel they can say, especially if they're going to face jail time. But you've got to ask, well, what's the importance of free speech? Um, you know, some of it is that you want to try and find out what's actually true. So it's useful to be able to clash swords in the marketplace of ideas to try and find out what's true. There are many things that would have been seen as unutterable many years ago. So, for example, if you said um, a black person and a white person ought to be able to get married, you know, this was uh, illegal under South African law. Um, if you said that um, two men ought to be able to get married, this was viewed as incomprehensible by many and immoral by others. Um, and many things that were seen as beyond the pale um, have now, through speech, um, become part of our law and become part of our social values. So we must accept that values can shift over time and that unpopular views can become popular over time. Um, so you want this latitude to express ideas. The other thing, as I point out, there's some kinds of ideas that are really distasteful and hateful. Um, but it's useful for us to know how often they're being expressed so we can 
dedicate our time towards combating them in other ways, as I say, through counter dialogue or education. Um, and that once we start to remove discussion of those things, we're going to be end up losing lots of other kinds of speech that's important and other kinds of information that's important. So it really ought to be um, a last resort um, to be regulating speech. There's something else that I often warn people of, which is that when you are crafting legislation, you are making a weapon and your enemies may one day inherit that weapon. So the ANC are unlikely to rule until Jesus comes back. Um, that there will be at some point a change in power. And if they have crafted rules that allow um, people to be jailed for their speech acts, those rules might very well be used against them at some point. Um, and so they must be very wary about the kinds of rules that they pass. I would find it odd that the EFF would vote in favor of these kinds of rules, given the stuff that they say on a regular basis. You really do have to have uh, quite a degree of hubris uh, to think that you won't be prosecuted, that the balance of forces might change, and that you'll wind up living, you know, living behind a jail cell. You also propose certain uh, solutions on how to combat this type of hate speech, looking specifically at Section 16.2 and the ambit that it provides. Um, can you speak more to this? How would you envisage the state strike a balance between upholding freedom of expression on the one hand and then sanctioning egregious forms of objectively harmful speech on the other? Yes, yeah, so if we think about what the Constitution um, allows the state to limit, it's propaganda for war, uh, the incitement of imminent violence, and then hate speech. Um, and the hate speech clause refers to only those four groups, and it refers to harm instead of violence. A lot of discussion um, in the legislation and in the constitutional litigation about, well, which group should we protect? The Constitution makes it quite clear that it's only those four that get this elevated protection. And it's not the constitutional drafters were unaware of other groups, because if you look at the Equality Clause, they mention, I think, 16 different groups. Um, so sexual orientation is listed there, marital status, you know, origin, nationality. Um, and there's a deliberate decision to have different thresholds. And so we can respect that by saying that if you incite imminent violence against any member of those groups, um, you know, albinism, uh, origin, etc., well, you know, then the state is entitled to sanction you. But um, it must be at that higher threshold of imminent violence as opposed to um, mere incitement to harm. Now, there might be an argument that you, through some kind of evidence, um, can say, well, some groups are analogous enough to the four. So, for example, the Supreme Court of Appeal in Kulani said, look, there's evidence that um, the gay community suffers uh, enormous prejudice that you've had people who are beheaded, you have a lesbian women that are correctively raped. Uh, these things start to look analogous to race, genesis, and religion because they're innate. Um, it's very hard to change your sexual orientation where it's very hard to change your, your race. Um, and so we might think that that should be at the same basis. But there are other things like your language that just seem maybe less and less uh, innate. It's people can speak a variety of languages um, that yeah, not all, not all grounds are, are identical with each other. We don't have the history of persecution on the grounds of language that we do have on the other grounds, for example. Dave, do you agree with what Mark has said, specifically about the deliberate drafting of Section 16 not to fall in line with Section 9? Yes, I think that's a very good point. Uh, clearly, in our kind of society, some language is unacceptable. And the Section 16 spells out what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. It is unacceptable that political leaders should get up on platforms and, and incite violence against specific people or specific groups. That should be punished, but that is already illegal. I don't see any need for the hate speech part of this bill. The only purpose that I can see in it is to put a dampener on freedom of expression and to give the state more power over the political debate. Thank you, Dave. And I'm going to just go to each of our speakers now for closing remarks on the bill. Mark, we'll start with you. I do think there's a very good argument that the bill is not necessary. In other words, we have a very small number of cases of genuine hate speech and that when they appear, we do have a legislative framework for punishment that can include criminal sanctions like the Rights Assemblies Act. Um, 
And there is, of course, this enormous danger that the legislation will be misused, that it will be used to uh, silence critics, that it will make it more difficult uh, for the press to report. For example, one of the um, exceptions is that if you've got the bona fide reporting of hate speech, that that will be protected. And so you can imagine that uh, some reporters will not be seen as being bona fide, that some newspapers will not be seen as bona fide, and suddenly you lose the protection when you want to report on, on hate speech. So that'll make you know, the press much more uh, circumspect in what they write about. Um, there's an argument that uh, this might explain why the press haven't reported much about Malema's recent obvious outbursts of hate speech, um, that maybe they're concerned about their own liability on that front. Um, so, yes, I think there's very good reason to be concerned about the bill. And I will say that civil society has played an enormous role um, in taking a piece of legislation that was uh, incredibly dangerous and watering it down, uh, but that the fight is not yet over. Dave, your final comments? Yes, I think all South Africans who are concerned about our constitutional democracy should oppose this bill. Uh, and if legislation of this kind is written, it should take into account the criteria laid down uh, by the uh, International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which is really trying to punish and uh, prohibit hate speech from political leaders and from people with high political profiles. That should be the goal. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Dave, for your time. And thanks to our audience for joining us for this episode of the Constitution at Work. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on post notifications to be alerted when our next video is up. If you have any feedback on today's episode, please feel free to have your say in the comments section. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at FW De Clark Foundation to keep up with our latest news. We look forward to checking in again soon. Bye.